Hello everyone, this is Kevin from PCIG Maddox. We're just getting ready to start the webinar. It's about two minutes before the hour and uh, we'll give you some time to get settled in. So we'll be right back. All right, well, it's two o'clock here in Ottawa, Canada, and uh, we're just about ready to get started with the webinar. So thank you very much for being here today. We appreciate you taking the time to learn about PCI technology. We hope that you learned something uh, useful about the new capability in our software. We're certainly very proud to be releasing it today and uh, you should be receiving some notifications via email. We'll be sending you the link to download the software and uh, everything is basically live at this moment. We've just gone live with uh, updates to our website and to access the new download uh, of the uh, software. So let's get started. So I'm Kevin uh, here at PCI. I've, uh, I've been uh, with PCI for about 10 years and I'm the director of marketing here at PCI and I'm joined by Salim who is one of our technical solutions specialists and Salim is uh, joined PCI within the last six months, and uh, he'll be giving you some of the uh, demonstrations today. So just a few logistics. The lines are muted, so you'll notice in the panel that uh, your line is automatically muted. Uh, we have to unmute you if you want to speak, so uh, don't worry about disrupting the presentation if you're speaking. If you're in a room with multiple people, you can keep working or discuss what you're seeing and or, or keep doing what you're doing. Um, you can ask questions throughout the webinar. We encourage you to do so. There's the questions panel available. So just pop it out, type your questions. If you see anything that you have a question about, by all means, uh, type them in. Myself and Celine will be looking out for questions throughout the webinar. Um, if you do have a problem, you can raise your hand. There is an option for raising your hand. Um, and in the Q&A session, if you actually want to ask us a question and you want us to unmute your line, we can do that. Of course, you have to be working on a computer where you have audio set up like a laptop with a headset like where I, where I like how I'm set up right now. So this is the first in a webinar series. So uh, Geomatica has just uh, been released, Geomatica Banff, which is, which is our big release uh, for this year. And really, it's, it's, it's to kick off a series of webinars, which we'll be giving over the coming weeks. Um, we plan to give you detailed webinars on the following topics. So we have object-based image analysis, automation with object-based image analysis as one of the key things that's part of this release. We'll be giving a detailed webinar on that on Tuesday, December 3rd at two o'clock here uh, Eastern time. And on December 10th, the following Tuesday, we'll be going uh, deep into UAV processing and information extraction with Geomatica. And then um, the same week on the Thursday, we'll be doing the Sentinel-1 TOPS processing with Geomatica. So be sure to register for all of these webinars if you're interested to find out about um, some more details about how to process. Today we'll be giving an overview. We'll be showing you some results galleries. But in these detailed webinars, we'll be doing a live processing, uh, pointing you to some sample data that you can work with to replicate what it is that we're doing in the webinars. So just a few quick words about PCI. 
PCI Geomatics is a company that has been developing advanced image processing software for over 37 years now. So we are a Canadian company and proud to be so. And we have developed a platform, what we consider to be a platform upon which you can build applications. On the left, you see our desktop image processing package, which is Geomatica, which is primarily what we'll be showing you today. And it can be used to process uh, smaller numbers of data, uh, but it can also be automated through the use of Python. So in the middle, we have our developer edition and the ability to put together workflows to repeat processing over and over again, either within the desktop or if you're working with very, very high volume production, if you're working with tens of thousands of data or, or more, uh, you can certainly use our GXL technology for speeding up, for uh, parallel processing, and for scaling your production alongside. So essentially, Geomatica is a platform upon which you can build applications and integrate with other applications as well. So we really think that this gives you uh, flexibility, scalability, and operational efficiency to deploy your applications. We have been releasing our software consistently over the last several years. So uh, recently, we did some analysis on the timing of the various releases. So for those of you who have been um, continually uh, purchasing or renewing your commitment to uh, receive support and updates from PCI Geomatics, uh, we like to think that you've been getting good value for your money. Uh, over the last uh, seven years, we've been averaging a release every five months. Uh, you can see the green flags or the big annual releases where there's major new functionality that's introduced and the red flags are the service packs which uh, can include um, uh, customer fixes or bug fixes but also include features and many of our service packs include uh, many many features so um, this release uh, basically is uh, very exciting a lot of new capability that's uh, included so let's get to it before we get to it i just want to launch a quick poll. We always like to engage with our audience and understand uh, what it is that uh, you're most uh, interested in and what it is that you're doing. So I'm just going to launch this poll. So what type of imagery do you typically work with? So you should see the poll appear on your screen right now. And uh, are you working primarily with UAV imagery? So that's very high resolution. Maybe it's aerial, such as uh, fixed wing, ultracam, DMC, ADS. Uh, maybe you're working with satellite optical uh, imagery such as Worldview, Playads, et cetera, uh, or maybe you're working with Sentinel SAR. So um, you can answer as many as you like. We're just trying to get a sense uh, of what type of data people are primarily working with in this webinar and also to inform our webinar series uh, going forward and how we can support you. If you are using other data, uh, you can use the questions panel to type in your, your other uh, answer. So I'm going to leave that open for just a few more seconds. I'll just count down from three. So three, two, one. So thanks very much for that. I'll just quickly share the results. You can see that uh, essentially we have uh, people using a lot of different types of data, but it looks like uh, satellite optical imagery has won the day. All right, thanks. So let's get back to the webinar. So Geomatica BAMP. So the uh, current release, uh, we, we basically have codenamed uh, BAMP. Uh, so it, uh, it's not a trademark or anything like that. It's just uh, Geomatica is our trademark. Um, however, we do want to celebrate the fact that we're a Canadian company and there really are some beautiful places in Canada. And these are important places that need to be preserved more and more as we, um, as we look at uh, climate change and environmental impacts it becomes more and more critical to preserve these environmentally sensitive areas and to recognize the role that remote sensing can play to understand the issues around uh, climate change. So we're quite passionate about this and um, we've decided to name uh, this release or to codename this release uh, Geomatica Banff. So um, you should see if you go to our webpage right now that we have a new landing page. This is the feature graphic on our new landing page and the download link should be working right now to access the latest version. We just launched that a few minutes ago. So today, what are we going to be doing? We're going to be uh, giving you uh, an outline of some of the key features that we think are important from this release. Uh, first and foremost, object-based image analysis and automation for repeat mapping and also for large data processing. 
We'll be looking at UAV image processing. We'll be looking at Sentinel-1 TOPS interferometric processing. So these are the three key areas that are uh, part of the release. There's been a number of changes, a number of improvements all through the software. Uh, however, these are the three key areas that we're choosing to highlight for this webinar and for the series. Um, we'll also give you just a quick summary of some of the other things and uh, point you in the right direction to understand exactly what's new in the release. So ob automation and object-based image analysis, object analyst. So essentially object analyst workflows. We have multiple ways of working now with object analyst. Previously, when we introduced the software in 2017, users would interact manually inside focus with a specific image. So they would work on uh, an image, do the segmentation, uh, do the attribute calculation, select training sites, and perform the classification on that single image within the focus window. That option is still there, that hasn't changed. However, what we've added is the ability to automatically process a batch of images within the focus environment. So there's a very nice, easy to use, uh, panel and automation capability within Focus, which we'll be giving you a quick highlight on today. Um, the other thing is because we have that Python API underneath, sitting underneath all of our software, you do have the option to call the algorithms one by one and implement automated workflows and uh, process your data in that manner if you, if you so uh, desire. Some updates. Attribute calculation additions, we've added some additional vegetation indices, some new texture measures, some additional geometrical attributes, and of course, as I already mentioned, the batch automated processing capability using the uh, support vector machine supervised classification training models. The vegetation indices, some of the new ones, so you can see uh, basically what we've added is the ability to read the metadata automatically from imagery. Here we have a Landsat uh, data set that's been collected. And when we ingest that data into the PCI system, as you know, we collect quite a bit of metadata. And that metadata allows us to tell which band is which. So which band is blue, green, red, near infrared. And as you can see, the vegetation indices that can be calculated using those bands are highlighted and those that cannot be calculated are not highlighted. Now, if this metadata is not automatically created, you do have the option to specify which band is which and process the data that way. So that's a, a nice new feature. The other thing is the texture window. So we do have the option now to right click on the texture window and specify the kernel size or the, the, uh, the amount of filtering to apply. Uh, interactively across a specific data or multiple data sets, as you'll see with the automation panel. The geometrical attributes, so you can see the new ones that have been added, convexity, solidity, and so on. So these are, are basically just going to help you uh, add more attributes to your data so that you can improve the fit between your training classes and your classification. Batch processing capabilities, so this is a big new capability as I mentioned. Um, so we see two possible ways in general of working with this tool. Um, one might be performing multi-temporal analysis. So if you uh, have a, a stack of data and you wish to classify using the same classes over time, what you could do is you can actually define a classification algorithm save the training model and then apply that to the other data sets throughout the stack. Um, so that's certainly one way to process and that's actually the one that we'll be showcasing today. Salim's going to show you a uh, data set where we did this over Calgary, Alberta in Canada. And the other way that we see this working is you could actually implement the same processing across multiple areas of interest. So for example, if you have multiple uh, data sets over the same types of areas where you're trying to uh, pull out the similar types of features, let's say, for example, high resolution satellite imagery, and you're trying to map water bodies or buildings or what, what have you, basically you, you could define a model across a certain template image, and then you could deploy that to multiple cities on the different data sets that are available. So the way this works is basically we can train the model inside uh, Focus, and we can establish a template in the GUI, and then we can apply that to the rest of the images. So we can uh, 
decide on the best segmentation to use, decide on the best attribute calculations to include, and then fit the model based on the training sites with the SVM and retain that fit between the classes and the, and the resulting classification to uh, store the hyperplane model to then replicate that classification across multiple data sets. This is roughly how it works. So uh, we essentially need the data to be the same. So you can see on the left, we have a certain number of bands and the, and, and the bands are in, and the information, the raster channels are expected to be the same and the, and the images to be processed. So those have to be the same. And um, essentially we perform the segmentation, do the attribute calculation, make the training sites. Then we perform the supervised classification using the support vector machine classifier, which is a machine learning algorithm. And then we store that fit between the classes and the classification result as a text file, which can then be reused to classify other data sets. So we'll be, we'll be showing that real quick. So this is just showing you uh, the Python version. So these are the actual algorithms. So OASEG, OACalc, AT, and OASVM class. So those algorithms can be uh, codified and processed. And you notice here on the right, the rasters to be processed have the same structure as the template image, which has been uh, pr used for training. So that's very important. And uh, Salim's going to show you this, but uh, basically this is what the automation tool looks like within Focus. Um, very simple to use. We specify a few parameters, uh, drag some parameters down from the processing canvas and run. So we'll, we'll get Salim to show that in a minute. And uh, at this point, I'll pass over to Salim, who, uh, who can show you what that looks like in the new version of uh, Geomatica. Salim, over to you. Thank you, Kevin, for showing the OBI workflow. Uh, I'd like to show you a quick overview of the automated OBIA results in a Geomatica window. This was an urban growth project results over 25 years in Calgary, Alberta. Calgary is a city in Canada, which is also fairly close to the Banff National Park. In this project, there are three classes, urban, vegetation, and water, but we are only going to focus on the urban class. Urbanization started in 1984, showing in purple followed by 1990 in orange, then in 2001, brown, and 2009, pink. Now I would like to show you the OBIA batch classification tool in Geomatica. All these steps above were performed manually for a single image. Now we are going to use the batch classification tool to automatically apply the template. I have selected my input folder for the images. Now I'm going to select an output folder for the result. Now I'm going to select my training model. Now I'm going to hit add. The batch classification window appears on the process canvas here. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to drag and drop the segmentation, attribute calculation, and the SVM classification. First, I'm going to drag and drop the segmentation. Now, I'm going to drop the attribute calculation. And I'm going to do the same thing for the SVM classification. I'm not going to, I'm not going to click run I won't go into more details right now, but we will be showing you the detailed demonstrations in the upcoming webinars. I will pass this back to you, Kevin.
Great. Thanks, Salim. Can you uh, mute your mic? Sorry, just, uh, yeah, thanks. Okay, so poll number two, just before we get going on the next part of the webinar, I'm just going to launch that. So the question is, what is your organization's biggest challenge uh, when it comes to uh, processing imagery? So um, is it uh, large uh, data sets and slow processing times, difficulty in automating workflows, uh, maybe it's lack of support to assist with troubleshooting, or maybe it's something else that we we, we can think of. Uh, let us know in the comments. We'd love to hear uh, what kind of issues you're having and what kind of challenges you're encountering when it comes to processing uh, remote sensing imagery. All right, it looks like a few of you are still voting, so I'll leave that open. And again, there's no right answer. It's just uh, market feedback or information for all of us, really. I'll share the responses after here. So I'm going to close it down in three seconds. Three, two, one. So I'm going to close it down and share the results out. So uh, looks like uh, large data sets and automation are kind of some key things that uh, people are running into. Um, so thanks for that feedback. We appreciate it and uh, hope that helps you as well. And uh, so moving along, UAV processing. So uh, PCI Geomatics has been developing technology for uh, aerial data processing for many years now. Um, we um, decided to reinvest in developing technology for aerial data processing. And um, the aim at the time was to uh, provide support for larger format cameras, more calibrated cameras, things like UltraCam, DMC, ADS, and so on. Um, and we've developed some pretty uh, great technology for processing aerial data. So the good news is that all of that development is now available for UAV data processing, because really UAV data processing is our standard aerial workflow. Uh, there's nothing different about it, except that we just make it easy for you to work with the UAV data. So we, we can extract one-to-one -one DSMs, we can filter the DSMs to DTMs. You then have the option as a user to produce a DTM ortho image or a DSM ortho image. And um, if you have building models, you can of course do uh, true ortho images with uh, building models and uh, ortho mosaicing and so on. So this technology has been developed over the last number of years and is quite advanced. And uh, this slide kind of nicely summarizes some of the unique benefits of working with aerial data or any data really, but for aerial, it makes the workflow a lot more streamlined. Uh, people who are doing aerial data processing may uh, have a need to make edits to DEMs to see what the impact on the orthos are going to be. So we have we have this live ortho capability where you can edit the DM and see interactively what the ortho is going to look like before you produce it over trouble areas like uh, overpasses or bridges or things like that. Uh, same philosophy for the interactive color balancing. So we allow you to drop points and uh, interactively adjust the brightness and the contrast. And then once you're done and you've created your mosaic and you still have some problem areas, we have some touch-up tools where you can enhance the contrast or uh, adjust the exposure or do these kind of small little changes changes at the very end without having to repeat all of the processing steps before. So all of this capability is available for people who are working with UAV data. This is just an idea uh, to give you a sense of a, um, a very nice data set using uh, 7.5 centimeter Osprey data, which is a, a Vexel uh, camera. So it's a Nadir, in this case, it's a Nadir camera. And you can see really the nice uh, clean edges along the, along the buildings. There's no occlusions, there's no uh, lean. And so what this, what this means, because our technology has been developed to make it possible to process the data this way, uh, you can actually generate a one-to-one -one ortho using the DSM. So the one-to-one -one DSM allows you to make the one-to-one -one ortho. So this is a, a very nice product that is obviously more desirable than, in some cases, a DTM ortho. Um, so for UAV processing, what we've actually implemented in this version, which you will be able to use, is we've, we've included some new methods to collect tie points. Um, and this new method, it's called feature-based matching. It's going to allow you to work with more 
challenging data sets. Uh, some of the data sets that have poor initial alignment, we have a lot of experience with some of this data. For example, we've done quite a few projects with historical air photos and UAVs in some cases have poor initial alignment because the GPS information that's captured with every exposure is of navigational instrumentation quality. So uh, the drone basically is uh, only storing its rough position based on uh, navigational uh, grade GPS. So it's within three to five meters. Now, if people are flying with an RTK system, then that's great. Then those coordinates can be used to have a better initial orientation. So uh, I guess the, the new capability is that we, we read the information from the EXIF tags in the data and we allow you to uh, automatically compute a block. So here you can see that we've ingested the data, we've read the uh, rough uh, latitude, longitude, and altitude of every image, and we've executed the first go at uh, collecting tie points, and that's called feature-based matching. And we did a very quick bundle adjustment, and within a few minutes of ingesting this data, we have a, a model that's converged that uh, looks like it's going to be uh, producing some pretty decent results. We can, of course, refine the RMS, and we have tools for doing that. Uh, but this basically makes quick work of ingesting UAV imagery and processing it just the way you would any other uh, data. For those of you who are familiar with our tools, you'll recognize all of these panels are the same. Uh, just some examples of some UAV processing results from recent, from the recent past. Uh, this is a one-to-one uh, -one DSM uh, over uh, EB dataset. Uh, this is the one-to-one -one mosaic over that uh, same location. And uh, this is a Wingtra dataset, so it's collected at one centimeter, just a stunning resolution here. Um, so this is the this is zoomed out. This is not a one-to-one -one resolution. This is the DSM. And if we go in at one-to-one -one resolution, you can really see some incredible things. Like if you keep your eye on, on this car over here, it's not obvious when you look at the image, but you can see that the boot of this car, the trunk, is actually open. Um, so if I load up the, the DSM on top of that, you can actually see that feature. And we, we can see that level of detail. Um, and we can also see the side mirrors on the car um, that, that are visible. So the ability to extract the DSMs at one-to-one -one resolution is really providing you information content from UAV imagery um, that is, is, is going to be helpful for many applications. Um, the other key thing with our UAV processing is that we have a new method for iterative block bundle adjustment, so it's called point refine. And what this does is it will actually allow you to set a target RMS for your type points or your GCPs or both and iteratively compute the block as blunders are being removed. Um, so what that does is it, it re reduces the amount of manual interaction where you're grooming the model sort of manually by removing points and recomputing it. It uh, introduces automation for block bundle adjustment through iterative processing, so it's quite nice. And uh, this is what the UAV image processing workflow looks like. Um, we pull the orientation using the EXIF tags. We do the tie point and GCP collection using the different methods available to us, including the new one called feature-based matching. From there, we can run point refine to converge the block. And then after that, everything is the same. So epipolar generation, DM extraction, ortho generation, either DTM or DSM, depending on your decision, mosaic, and then the live edits uh, at the end. So I'm going to pass over to Salim once again, who is going to give you a quick rundown on the uh, UAV uh, demo that we'll be giving uh, later on. Thank you, Kevin, for showing the UAV workflow. In focus, I'll be showing you the results of an UAV imagery processed in Orto Engine. This is a query data set available on SenseFlies, SenseFlies website for download. So what we are looking at right now is the raw imagery. No adjustments have been made yet. This orientation is based on the EXIF tags. This is the DSM extracted from the imagery. And this is the mosaic created by the DSM. 
this is a very straightforward process that we will be showing in the upcoming webinar for the UAV processing and information extraction with Geomatica. But before I pass it back to Kevin, I would like to show you an overview of the Orto Engine Type Point Collection window. So this is the Orto Engine toolbar. And what we are looking at right now is the tie point distribution and also the color coding based on the rays and connectivity. Back to you, Kevin. All right, thanks, Salim. Let me just get set up here. Okay. Perfect. So um, moving on to Sentinel-1 Top. So this is another key highlight of our release. Um, we have supported Sentinel-1 since it was launched uh, roughly in 2015. Uh, we did add support for Sentinel-1 data. Um, however, the majority of the data that's collected from Sentinel-1 is, uh, is an interferometric wide. And uh, this is a, a mode that uh, is a little bit more complex to, or, or um, uh, there's a few more steps involved to uh, uh, introduce uh, support into our software. So um, we uh, dedicated some uh, quite a bit of effort to introduce support for TOPS mode in Geomatica in this version. <clears throat> Sentinel-1 A and B, so there's two satellites, uh, provide coverage every six days. So it's actually possible to uh, do interferometry every six days using either A or B in, in, in tandem. Um, so it's quite nice uh, to be able to do that. It provides high temporal resolution. It provides wide area coverage. The images are quite large. The interferometric wide images are hundreds of kilometers wide. And of course, the data is freely accessible and it can be downloaded through uh, their application programming interface, which allows you to script workflows and build applications and so on. Um, so with this capability now, what you could do is you could download imagery, uh, process it through a geomatical workflow and provide a service, if you wish, um, using end-to-end uh, -end processing. Um, this is an example of some of the complexities that we have to deal with with the Sentinel-1 TOPS mode. Um, so basically this is a, an image um, that's composed of three SWAs. So the interferometric Y, the IW data, is collected in three separate SWAs. And each swath is composed of multiple bursts. Uh, so the antenna is actually swinging and it's uh, collecting these different bursts. And uh, so reassembling all of these bursts to produce a single image is obviously very desirable because that means that the end user can um, choose any part of the image that they would wish to work in in order to perform processing. So what we have done is we have built technology that allows you to assemble all of those bursts and all of those swaths into a single contiguous image. As you can see on the screen, this is a Sentinel-1 TOPS dataset that has been ingested using PCI GDB technology. And uh, we have a single image. We can process the entire image all at once or we can focus on a specific area of interest and process a, a subset of the image. Um, so the de-bursting is obviously uh, something that uh, we spent quite a bit of time on to allow you, the user, to have a contiguous geocoded image, which is a lot easier, we think, uh, to work with than the burst mode data. Um, we've also eliminated a lot of the redundant overlapping area of the images. All of those bursts overlap, so we basically give you an image that doesn't have the redundant uh, pixels. And we can uh, actually, if you're familiar with our SAR tools, you'll uh, be very happy to learn that you just ingest a Sentinel-1 TOPS image exactly the same as you would any other image. Um, so you can open it in focus, you can run our SAR ingest algorithm either at the Python level or within uh, other environments. Uh, so it's, it's completely seamless to you, the user. It's quite easy to use. Now, when we were developing this technology over the course of the summer, um, we happened to come across an uh, earthquake that occurred in California in Ridgecrest. And so we very quickly uh, downloaded some imagery and had a look to see um, what we could do with the technology, whether our technology was able to produce results that were uh, uh, 
uh, similar to what other people were doing. There's quite a few people who processed data over Ridgecrest at the time. Of course, every time there's an earthquake, um, performing this type of processing could be quite useful to assess damage and to provide information to uh, rescue efforts and so on. Um, so the Ridgecrest earthquake, just for your info, uh, was basically composed of two major um, quakes, I guess, or one major earthquake followed by an even bigger aftershock. So the initial earthquake was on July 4th, and it was a magnitude 6.4 earthquake, and then there was an aftershock that was actually bigger on July 5th, which was a 7.1. So what we did is we downloaded some interferometric-wide data, processed it to generate the uh, deformation maps and measure the actual ground deformation uh, based on this particular earthquake. Very simple to do. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, um, ESA has the Copernicus program. As part of the Copernicus program, they have the Sci-Hub. So you can uh, head to a website, register for a free account, download some images, and uh, start working, which is exactly what we did. So um, we headed to the Copernicus website. You can see it here. We specified a search area over Ridgecrest, which is where we knew the earthquake had occurred. And we actually found some images that were collected literally hours after the earthquake. So you can see here the uh, July 4th image was collected at 1500 UTC, which is, I believe it was about nine hours following the earthquake. Um, so within nine hours, there was an image collected. And then the beauty of Sentinel, of course, is you can actually mix A and B. So here what we did is we actually combined a Sentinel 1B with a Sentinel 1A image. And you can, of course, repeat the processing with the repeat pass image, which is 12 days later, so you can keep staggering your analysis that way. You can also do ascending and descending. In this case, we're looking at the, uh, I believe it was, yeah, so it's the, the ascending imagery. So great data out there. Uh, very excited to um, be able to process this imagery with uh, Geomatica. So here's the entire image that's been collected. And uh, you can see that uh, we chose to uh, subset or take a piece of the image, which is where the epicenter of the earthquake was, and uh, only work on that image. So we have that flexibility. You can see that we're actually straddling two different swaths, and that doesn't matter because we've assembled the image as one continu contiguous image, which gives you, the user, the ability to focus in on a specific area, no matter which swath it is. You don't have to process two different swaths. This is our... Uh, standard workflow, nothing changes for uh, TOPS. Everything is the same. So SLC data, SAR ingest, co-registration, raw interferogram, topographic phase removal uh, with the DEM. If we supply the DEM, we're interested in measuring deformation. If we don't supply the DEM, then we're interested in measuring the actual topography. But in this case, we're trying to understand the deformation on the ground. Then we have our filtering with uh, the modified Goldstein filter and then the unwrapping to produce the results. So I've got some quick results to show here. These are the two images, just the backscatter images. And uh, this is the actual um, uh, filtered interferogram. Once we remove the topographic effects and we remove the atmospheric effects and we're left with the actual fringes that relate to the earthquake itself. And you can see the the two uh, center points here are representing the location of the earthquake. So this is the 6.4 and this is the 7.1, I believe. And these fringes, basically what it's showing is uh, when the fringes are, are close together, it's showing that there's been a lot of movement over a small geographical area. And each uh, cycle is basically representing half of a wavelength in movement. So. Uh, if we go from blue to blue here, we're basically looking at 2.3 centimeters of movement over that space uh, or that um, that amount of uh, space on the ground. Um, so you can see that when the fringes get really, really close together, there's been more movement over a smaller area. And you can actually also see the disturbance in the coherence. This is the strength of the signal backscattered over the two different images. And where we have loss of coherence, basically it's telling us that there's been some changes on the ground in that location. And definitely along this area, the changes on the ground are due to the actual movement of the ground. And you can see some other loss of coherence over uh, vegetated areas. These are irrigated crop circles. Of course, those would have irrigation or no irrigation and would have differences in coherence. 
Um, it was quite encouraging when we did this processing. We compared the results to uh, some very well-respected processing that's been done by NASA and JPS Caltech. Um, at the same time, they were processing some PALSAR2 data, which is an L-band sensor. Uh, and so we basically plotted our results up, up, up uh, next to their results. And it was very encouraging to see that, uh, obviously, uh, the same patterns are present. Now, the fringes are longer in the case of the PALSAR data because it's an L-band sensor. So half the wavelength represents roughly 12 or 13 centimeters as opposed to 2.3. So that's why the fringes are different, but the patterns are uh, very, very similar. And of course, there could be some subtle differences depending on the actual acquisition dates that were selected. We chose July 4th and 10th, and uh, perhaps they're using different dates. Actually, I believe the uh, original image was uh, quite a bit uh, longer before the, um, the earthquake. Um, so I'm just going to quickly show you uh, when we're going to dive deep into this um, in, uh, in our webinar. Sorry, I'm not quite ready for this, but let me, let me set up here. Whoops. All right. Um, well, I'm going to skip the demo. Sorry about that. I will try one more time here. Sorry about that, folks. Just a quick second. So let me go see if I can open up this project. Um, yeah. Yeah, so basically um, we'll, we'll be showing you in the webinar how it is that we can actually process the data to produce these results. You can see here in my files panel, I've got the backscatter image. Um, I've got um, the dependent image, which is the July 10th image. And then I have all of my different products. So the deformation uh, products. And uh, this is basically just showing you the actual uh, fringes. Um, this is the location of the earthquakes. And we've also downloaded some of the fault line information and overlaying that on top. And uh, here's kind of the, the backscatter image uh, from one of the two dates. So we'll be running through this entire workflow. We'll be providing you with Python scripts and giving you all the information you need to repeat this processing or even uh, replicate the processing with data sets of your choosing. All right, last poll and uh, we're just about done. So uh, one of the things that I really want to highlight is the fact that uh, people like Celine, we actually have multiple people on our team who can give you uh, uh, firsthand help. So basically what they could do is they can uh, jump on a call, they can uh, work with you, um, identify a data set of interest, show you how to work with a particular part of our, of our software and help you basically evaluate the technology faster. So we know that it does take time to download the software. Uh, we know that uh, it, uh, it, it, it can be a big investment. Maybe you don't want to learn how to use the interface. If you're new to Gmatica or if you're using another tool, then, um, you know, these, these guys are uh, very well skilled in using our technology. We have a uh, a deep uh, set of uh, people available to support them um, to troubleshoot and get you to evaluate the technology a lot faster. So you can uh, point them to data, point them to let them know what you're trying to do, and they'll be happy to process data and uh, show you what, uh, how to do it, how to replicate the steps. All right, I'm going to close that down. So I'm just going to count down three, two, one. Great. So thank you so much for that. I'm now going to kind of uh, focus on other highlights. So one of the other key things uh, for those of you who are listening to us from Canada or other parts of the world, uh, we're very excited in uh, June of 2019, Canada launched the Radarsat Constellation Mission or RCM. And uh, in this release, we basically have support for RCM now. We have worked with simulated data and we've worked with some of the data that the Canadian Space Agency has provided to us for testing our software and we're comfortable in saying that we support the RCM data. However, 
the commissioning phase has not quite been completed. I understand that it will be completed very, very soon. Um, but we are confident in saying that you will be able to load RCM data and uh, visualize it and uh, um, basically work with RCM data. So that's available in this version of the software. We've got some other things uh, which we've already kind of highlighted, but uh, we'll be uh, providing you additional information on. Uh, we have a new layer type as part of the Geomatic of Focus. Uh, the relief, shaded relief layers are automatically available now. All of our aero triangulation tools have been improved. As I mentioned, the block bundle adjustment, the iterative um, block bundle adjustment that's available Live Ortho, uh, what I showed you in that panel is a little bit of an older implementation of our ortho, Live Ortho capability. There's some new capability now that's that's even better. Uh, we have integration from Bingo, which is a very advanced uh, aero triangulation package. And uh, really what I encourage you to do is to read the what's new. If you head to our website, uh, basically you will be able to uh, see everything that's new. So I'm just going to head there right now and show you up on the screen. Um, so if you head to the uh, corporate website, um, you'll see that there's a new uh, landing uh, um, feature graphic that's available now. So you can click through to the dedicated page that has all of the information relating to this version of uh, Geomatica. And uh, so you can basically uh, look at some of the uh, processing capability for object analyst and uh, Sentinel-1, which is the uh, demonstration which we'll be providing later on in, in December, UAV processing, and then we have a lot of other capability. And if you want to download the software, you basically just uh, hit uh, Try Geomatica. What that's going to do is it's going to bring you to our uh, download page, just to provide your email address and which country you're from, and you'll be able to access the download. It's live right now. Um, just summing up before we go to Q&A, uh, as I mentioned off the top, this is a, a series, uh, the kickoff to a series of webinars. We'll be presenting an additional webinar on December 3rd, December 6th, and December 12th on the three key topics that we've uh, highlighted here as part of the new release. So be sure to look for the registration links and uh, emails and so on to uh, register for all of those upcoming webinars. And with that, um, Oh, one more thing. So uh, you can just simply head to getgeomatica.com. It's just another way to get to the same place to download the software. We have a lot of resources available. We have a support website, which is which includes tutorials, and uh, uh, there's some chat forums available where other users have encountered issues, and, and our support department has helped them, or other users has help, have helped them. Uh, we have a developer landing page, uh, dev.geomatics.com dev.pcigmatics.com. We actually have a self-learning or uh, online learning uh, capability through Udemy. There's four courses available, including SAR. Um, we have over 120 videos on YouTube and specific playlists. We have our support department, which is available, our pre-sales team, which I already mentioned, of course. And uh, I encourage you once again to stay in touch with us to see what's new with all the webinars coming up. So with that, I'm going to um, head to questions and see uh, see what's been brewing here in the questions panel. So if you have any questions right now about anything we've shown, uh, be sure to type them into the questions panel and uh, we'll try to answer them. So I am just looking here at um, uh, one question regarding UAV processing. So um, the question is relating to accuracy assessment and comparison between our UAV uh, and common processing software such as uh, UAS Master or PIX4D Agisoft. So in terms of uh, accuracy assessment, we haven't done specific um, accuracy assessments. However, we have done some comparisons in terms of the processing times. Um, so the ability to uh, process the data and to generate all of the results, we've actually run tests using uh, both uh, our software and some of the other software packages. And we found that our software basically is processing um, like on a desktop environment, pretty much at the same speed, a little bit faster, uh, but we do have the ability to implement parallel processing and we can scale up using GXL as well. So there is that option if speed is a problem. Uh, however, the key differentiator we think for UAV is the ability to um, 
to, to basically generate the DSMs at one-to-one -one resolution so that you can generate a superior quality ortho mosaic and also have that information layer available for uh, object-based uh, uh, feature extraction. The demonstration that we'll be showing you is uh, basically extracting solar panels off building rooftops. Um, and that's made possible because we have the high resolution uh, information available. So we have a question about, is live ortho the same as true ortho? Uh, so not quite the same. Uh, live ortho basically is a technique or a, a set of tools that we make available as part of the uh, photogrammetric workflow to allow you to make edits live and see the results on the final ortho images. Uh, true ortho is a different technique, which is basically producing uh, ortho images that have removed occlusions or uh, building lean um, using either the DSM ortho uh, technique or the building models which have to be provided externally. Uh, we have a question about when the new version will be delivered to clients. So basically, um, for, for those of you who are listening in who uh, are part of our reseller channel, uh, the software is available now. Um, so you uh, you can contact uh, salespeople to uh, work through uh, getting that into the hands of your end customers. Um, so we have a question about um, the minimum number of Sentinel-1 scenes used for the interferometry to achieve good results. Um, so it, it really comes down to what it is that you're doing. If you're measuring uh, ground deformation, definitely uh, collecting a time series that is uh, uh, a significant, that has a significant amount of collections, let's say at least 10 or 15 images. Uh, the more images you have in your stack, the better you'll be able to model the trend. Uh, so actually as part of the webinar, which we'll be giving on December 12th, we're going to be processing some time series data over an area that produces oil in California. And we'll be discussing that in more detail. Um, so um, the question about uh, uh, compact pole analysis. So, can you comment if you have to if you have new tools for compact pole analysis? So, interestingly, um, we actually developed a compact pole capability almost four years ago now. So, the capability has been in our software for many years, and we have tested it with RCM data, and it does work. Um, at this time, I do not believe that we've implemented anything new as it relates to compact pole, um, but all of the tools that were developed in anticipation for RCM are functional and are working uh, now. Um, okay, we've got quite a few more questions. I'll maybe just take one more and then we'll, we'll call it a day. So um, let's see. Uh, one question about um, whether we are planning to put more courses on udemy.com. Um, at this time, we don't have any solid plans for doing that, but uh, we uh, were certainly welcome to, or we're, we're uh, planning to do that uh, definitely in the future. We um, And we'd love to hear what specifically you'd love us to, uh, to provide on Udemy. Uh, so far, what we've done is we've provided a course, kind of an intro to Geomatica, if you're new to the tool. Uh, we have a course on uh, historical air photo processing. We have a course on aerial data processing, and we have a course on SAR. Um, so we're uh, we're willing to uh, uh, to help you uh, to develop whatever course material you'd, you'd like to see. Uh, of course, we uh, we don't have a huge team, so uh, we uh, we need to uh, focus our efforts where it is that you are most interested in us uh, focusing them. So with that, I'm going to um, bring the webinar to a close. I'd like to thank you, members of the audience, for taking the time to uh, hear all about the new release. We're certainly very excited about all the new capability. Um, we think uh, more than ever the ability to automate workflows and to work with uh, so many da data sets is very, very exciting. And uh, we really look forward to uh, hearing from you on your experience working with Geomatica 
If you ever have any questions, you could just contact me directly, jones at pciigmatics.com. Happy to interact with you. I have a very active LinkedIn account for those of you who uh, use LinkedIn. You can reach out to me that way as well. Always happy to hear about what people are doing with our software and uh, definitely want to make sure that you're successful. So I want to thank Salim and uh, uh, once again, thanks very much for being here today. Have a good day.